All right, here we are. And we're at the Boogaboo of Caster Angle. What it does and why you need it. There's a couple of parameters in design of uh, car suspensions and geometry that will start a fist fight among uh, designers. Uh, this is the second one, second most popular one, is caster. It's sometimes well understood, sometimes partially understood, sometimes it's not understood at all. But I'm going to try to distill this down and make it simple. Now, if we have our upright and our spindle, we have our kingpin, which is inclined on this axis, but it is not in on the incline fore and aft. Caster is the incline of the kingpin axis along the longitudinal axis of the vehicle. If I take my little spirit level and put it right here, I should more or less get a zero, yes, yes, more or less get a zero on the bubble. This one flops around up here, so it's not accurate. You gotta do it on the back one because of the hinge. Now, so, we saw what kingpin inclination can do to the wheel, can actually force it down into the ground, lift the front of the vehicle as you turn the wheel from straight ahead. Now, caster is the incline of the kingpin. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tilt it back. And so I know sort of what I'm doing. I'm going to fire up my inclinometer and I'm going to put in about seven and a half degrees or so. You need a minimum amount of caster. If you do not have a minimum amount of caster, now you can't really see this, but I can, so you'll have to trust me that I'm going to get it about right. Actually, that's 10 degrees, that's fine. That's fine. We'll go with that. The actual number. Not important. I'd rather have more than I would normally use for purposes of illustration right now. I'm going to crank these down a little bit so that it doesn't slip on me. Now, caster and why you need it. How many people have ever heard of a furniture caster? This is a furniture caster. This, they call it a caster because it works on the caster principle. And basically the principle is, is that the pivot point is different from the contact patch. And in order for a rolling wheel to be stable when it's free to pivot about a point, is that the contact patch must be behind the pivoting act point. If I pull, I'm stable. Why? Because the pivot point is here, the contact patch is here. This wants to trail behind the pivot point. Trail, trail, trail. This is where the term trail comes from and all it is, if you extend the pivot down to ground level, mark it, measure back to the contact patch, that's your trail in inches or centimeters. Now what happens when you try to go backwards? Instantly, instantly, as soon as you get any velocity at all, it spins around on you. It is not stable in reverse. You can do it if you go really, really slow and carefully, but what happens is that the frictional drag on the contact patch is trying to swing the wheel behind and find the stable position. How many among you have tried to reverse a car at ridiculously fast speeds? I know I have. I know it becomes exponentially more difficult to keep that car going in a straight line. And if you just keep pushing it, you can violently spin the car out. This is why. Your front suspension has caster in it. So when you're in reverse, everything's fine as long as you're going slow. You get up to about 20, 25 miles an hour and all of a sudden, I mean, it just becomes impossible to do it. And caster, caster, caster. So what we have is caster is for straight line stability. 
If we did not have caster, if we did not have kingpin inclination to keep the wheels wanting to run in a straight line, the faster we drove a vehicle, the more darty it would become until it would become unstable and people would crash, injure themselves, possibly die. It is absolutely for stability. The faster the vehicle, the more caster it must have. Indy cars need a lot more than autocross cars, but autocross cars need some. Why? Because there are certain scenarios and situations where the caster can go to zero or can go negative. If it ever goes negative, then you have that furniture caster trying to whip around and the wheels go into violent shape. They usually do that under braking. Why? Because the front end of the vehicle will dive down into braking, the back end will come up. If you have very, very shallow caster angle, then guess what? It goes, it goes to zero and it can even go negative. When, as soon as it goes negative, this wheel's trying to turn around and you get violent shake in the vehicle. So it's important to have enough. Okay, so that's the stability question. What does it actually do to the load on the tires and what does it do to the car when you actually turn? Now, before we saw with nothing but kingpin inclination as we moved away from straight ahead, the wheel would dive down and touch the tabletop in both directions. Now let's see what happens here. Let's move this to the rear. Move it to the rear. Whoa, it's already on the tabletop. Didn't have to move very much at all. Let's bring it back to straight ahead. Now let's swing it here. Hard left turn. Whoa, it goes way into the air now. Here's what happens because this is on an incline, I'll take the wheel off. The spindle starts out parallel. It's got two inclinations. It's got two tilts. So one tilt is trying to bring it down and the caster tilt is trying to, when it's moving this way, is trying to swing it up, but the kingpin inclination is trying to swing it down. So they're fighting one another. And depending on which one has the greater angularity, that's the one that's going to win. Now, what happens when we move to the rear? Well, kingpin's trying to move it down, but guess what? The axle's tilted, so so is caster. So when it moves, the wheel moves this way, double whammy, double effect. The effect is multiplied. Okay, that's all very nice and good, but what does that really have to do with the car? And that's what I'm going to show you next. Right, now, we have our caster angle, we have our kingpin inclination, and what I've done is added weights and put scales under all four wheels. Now, as it comes out with the main part of the analog here leveled, which is, you should do, it doesn't do any good if it's up or down or tilted, I'm reading 19 pounds on this front wheel, 19 pounds on this one, 15 and 15 on the back. So, now what do you think is going to happen when we steer in a hard left or a hard right? Okay, because of the tilt of the kingpin axis, both to the rear and to the center line of the car, this wheel is going to try to come up. This wheel is going to try to come down. We should see a change in load at the contact patch because what the scales are reading are the load at the tire contact patches. So let's do that. Let's roll this around to here. This one should be coming up. This one should be coming down. Now remember, we just all we're doing is making a hard whoop, right turn. Now let's see what it did to the weights. Left front, because this one came up into the air, it's now down to f less than 15 pounds. It's down to about 14 and a half pounds. 14 pounds. This one's down to 14 pounds. This one went from 19 to 24 pounds. It picked up five pounds. This one lost five pounds. Five pounds from 19 pounds is a significant percentage of load 
It's huge. And this analog will demonstrate this principle better than a vehicle. There are no springs, only springs in the steel itself. We look in the back, we should see a change back here. If the wheel that loaded highly, if we look on the diagonal, this one is now up to 22 pounds of load on this rear wheel, and this one has dropped, drooped down to seven pounds. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called wedge. This is when the car is said to be wedged on the diagonal, which means the tire loading on the diagonal is greater on one diagonal than it is the other. This can work with you, this can work against you. Now when you're cornering a vehicle, it's obvious that the tire load on the outside front wheel, is going to, that wheel is going to receive the most load and has to deal with the most loads. This actually removes load, your caster removes load from the outside wheel, puts it over here on the inside wheel which is trying to completely unload, so now you get the inside wheel contributing. The downside is, as you remove load from this wheel, you remove load from this wheel, the inside rear wheel. So basically, you've improved the grip on three and you have greatly lessened the grip on one. Overall, is it an advantage or a disadvantage? Depends on a lot of variables, but usually it's an advantage, as long as you don't carry it too far. But caster can actually help the inside wheels, which is one of the hardest things to do, to get them to carry a load, especially the inside front. And that is what you're having to contend with with kingpin inclination and caster. The, when we talked about Ackerman and reverse Ackerman, here again, there's been great arguments on that, that reverse Ackerman is superior to Ackerman Steering. Ackerman is perfect geometry so the tires run, you know, turn all center to describe the line that they're supposed to, the circle that they're supposed to, while reverse Ackerman don't. And it is said that reverse Ackerman improves the lap times because of slip angles and all like this. I say that's a minor, minor consideration. I think that the main thing that improves lap times is that the inside wheel, which is being driven down by both kingpin inclination and caster, the inside wheel has less angularity, so there's less load change. And like I say, it's Goldilocks. You can have too much, you can have too little. What you need is just right. And that's the secret of a setup.